Okay. So for those of you that are at the breakpoint, did anyone find anything that's pointing at our shell code or anything that we control or anything like that? I think I have something which may be at a place we control. So it seems like the ESP plus 8 address is, at least for me, 12FFB0, which is within that buffer range. Yeah. Yeah, that's exactly right. So, um, if we look at the stack, at the time the exception handler um, program starts running, at the point we gain control of EIP, the third address on the stack, 12FFB0, points to the current exception handler record. The first four bytes of the current exception handler record is that next pointer that we overwrote with this junk or whatever that didn't really care about it. It's just a pointer on a linked list. If we are to do something like jump ESP plus 8, we would be jumping to attacker control data. Now granted, it would only be four bytes of attacker control data. Because what we have right here is 4017FF. This is what we used to gain control of EIP. The uh, third thing on the stack here is a pointer to attacker control data, AAAAA. But um, we can't clobber this because we need this in place to keep control of EIP, essentially. So what we could do is do something like jump ESP plus 8 and then put another relative jump right here, jump forward some bytes so that we're executing all this, and this is attacker control data. And it turns out if um, this doesn't point to a stack address and it set points to like jump ESP plus 8 or something like that, the Windows exception handler will allow it. So, I want you guys to, um, actually I'll just go ahead and tell you, no, I won't torture you too much. The, uh, the general paradigm for what people use to exploit this is they point EIP at a pop pop return instruction. Okay, so any sort of two pops followed by a return. Because if we were to point, put EIP equal to one of those, when this runs it would go pop this off the stack, pop this off the stack, and set EIP equal to this and look attacker control data. And what they do is jump forward past this, because we need this in place. This will be our the address of our pop pop return instruction. And in here we can put our calc shell code or whatever. So who can find a pop pop return style construct in um, the safe the uh, SCH overflow program. It's actually a very common construct. Let's see who can find one first. Pop into any two registers, it doesn't matter, then return. We just want to get rid of those two things off the stack. Have ESP pointing to here, return, ESP equals this, attacker control data, good to go. What was it? 7C901. 901-4E0. Okay. This will actually not work if you use this one. You have, so the reason is, it's an exploit mitigation technology that I haven't talked about yet <coughs> called Safe SEH. And what Safe SEH does is it registers a table of valid function pointers that are, a DOL is able to use as, as the exception handler. And um, if anything is not in that table, 
then the exception handler will not process it. So the pop pop return isn't in, in there. However, a lot of modules don't opt into the safe SEH style table. It's on a per DLL basis. So there are going to be some DLLs and some components in your process that don't opt into safe SEH that don't have one of these tables. And if the uh, DLL doesn't have one of these tables, the process um, exception handler or code is going to say, all right, it doesn't have a table, so just whatever, you know, if the exception handler points in that um, DLL's address space, and it doesn't have a table, then sure, just allow it, because whatever, I don't care. So we can actually look at which modules opt into safe SCH, which ones don't, with this uh, cool plugin, which I'll talk more about tomorrow, called Gnarly. And as you can see here, um, Gnarly, written by Doc Savage here, has this cool ASCII art, because any cool, respectable exploit developer has awesome ASCII art that he uses as a signature. And if we use .bank in mod, it tells us what has safe SCH on, what has safe SCH off, among other things, like ASM. So in this case, all these Windows DLLs, like default Windows DLLs, like NTDLL, which I think is what you guys were referring to with that 7C1, have safe SEH on. So we can't point the uh, exception handler function pointer into the uh, NTDLL address space, just any bytecodes we want, because it has that table of valid exception handler function pointers. How do you recognize that just from looking at the code? I mean, how did you recognize it when you saw that? Uh, which ones has safe SCH? Yeah, when you looked at the disassembly, you recognized right away that it was the... Well, uh, I kind of reference that GTL now. Oh, the 7C and so forth? Yeah. Oh, it's just because I had an address range memorized. Because mm -hmm. I'm a giant nerd. Mm -hmm. um, so to use gnarly, do dot load gnarly. And then if you use dot bank, bang in mod, it'll give you all this stuff which we're going to use tomorrow to tear apart you know, exploit mitigations. And um, these two, I've compiled this binary uh, specifically to not have safe SEH. So I was sort of expecting, uh, Sam, that your issue was you accidentally turned safe SEH back on somehow. So if that's a safe SEH on, that would be the source of your problems. But um, Windows is actually pretty good these days about turning all this crap on for their exploit mitigations. And um, so it's kind of hard to abuse the Windows ones, but most application DLLs don't opt into any of this stuff. Um, so yeah, if you were, so like in particular, I just kind of randomly chose Flash, and guess what? You put Flash in gnarly and it doesn't opt into anything. It has basically no exploit mitigations turned on. Uh, not just Flash, though. Most application DLLs, like DLLs that come with applications not provided by Microsoft, don't opt into any of these things, so we can use pop-up returns from their address space. In our case, I compiled it so that safe SEH was um, turned off in our SEH overflow, so anything that points in the text segment of SEH overflow should be fair game. So I think Xeno found a pop pop return in there. So um, this construct actually appears a lot. Pop pop return. Um, and you can see because it's really only like three bytes, 5B, 5B, C3. So we just out of sheer randomness, those three bytes will probably appear somewhere in the code segment. But you could also use like add ESP8 and return or anything like that. That's just what the pop pop return is effectively accomplished. Um, use a bunch of custom programs that I've written, to be honest. Uh, the way I usually search for it in um, WinDebug is that I know that pop ESI occurs right before return a lot. So I search for pop ESI and return. So I figure out what the opcodes are for pop ESI and return. And I do a search for that in a process address space. 
And then if I see one more pop for that, I know that I've got a pop pop return. And after a while, you can just sort of recognize that these are the bytes associated with um, so forth. But there are some uh, plugins out there that will kind of, you know, find it a lot more auto manually. But it's really kind of like so common, you can probably just like scroll through the text segment and just assemble a window and see it appear. It used to be that um, EBX pointed directly at like attacker controlled data, but um, this was like abused by the RPC DCOM code red worm or whatever. And so Microsoft felt compelled to change that. And so they made it where most of the registers are zeroed out when the exception handler begins running. Or not pointing to any sort of interesting data. But, um, you know. The pointer to the exception handler record itself is still on the stack, eight bytes up the stack, so they spent all that time and money to make it where EBX was null at this point and um, not pointing an attacker control data, but hey, look, it's still eight bytes up on the shell code, so it doesn't really accomplish much. We can still do whatever we want to with these things. Okay. So this is going to be the last lab of the day, guys. Um, and it's going to be a little bit involved because there's some moving pieces in here that I haven't quite told you about. And I want you to get calc.exe to spawn in SCH overflow by making the exception handler function pointer point at that pop-pop return. The pop-pop return can either be in SCH overflow address space or in flash because neither of those opt into neither of those offer that table of function pointers. You can just use the one that we, table of function pointers. You can just use the one that we just rattled off. That will get EIP equal to the first four bytes of the exception handler you've overwritten, and then you'll need to do some stuff to uh, get calc.exe shellcode. So that is your quest for the rest of the day. And then once you guys have mastered the art of overwriting your exception handlers, tomorrow we will forge ahead with turning on all exploit mitigations and then Redeveloping our exploit for this call mitigations turned on so that you will be able to exploit vulnerabilities in the presence of all exploit mitigation technologies that uh, Windows has to offer. So I'm going to start working through this on my own for anyone that wants to watch and follow along with me. So right here, first of all, what was the address of the uh, That's on purpose, you know, so you know, antagonizing me, making fun of me for dropping the point being sick all the time. What was the address of the pop pop return that you guys are using? 401 490. Can you read it backwards? Oh, sorry. Uh, 9014 40. Okay, and then that should put pop pop return will make EIP point at where these bytes are at, so I'm going to do EP06 forward 6 bytes. Right here I'm just going to replace this with a CC shellcode for now. Oopsie. Nine zero one four four zero zero zero. Is that it?
So at this point, I've replaced the exception handler function pointer with top hop return address. That's going to point the EIP at where these opcode bytes are at. So I'm going to change them to jump forward six bytes. That's going to go plus one, plus two, plus three, plus four, plus five, plus six, and give me these CC bytes. I CC shell code. And that's where I'm at right here. Now here's the problem. This is the limit of my stack, 130000. You can tell it's a main tech extension. And I'm currently at 12FFB8. That only gives me 72 bytes for my shellcode, which isn't a lot in the window shellcode world. Window shellcode is generally pretty beefy because all that crazy parsing and jumping around that I described before it has to do. So, what should we do? Ben, you have the an answer? Yeah, how are we going to do that? Here's what I'm going to do. At this point, we know we don't have enough room. I'm going to put good old calc shell code. I have no idea if this is going to work. If we're going to run into that ESP corrupting us problem again. Right there at the very beginning of my payload. Now, what was the address of my buffer? What was it this? That's the valid. I don't know if it is or not. Let's see. It's V6. To FD6. Yeah, so this is where my uh, buffer starts. This is where my shell code will end up when I restart it. So I'm going to use the windy bug. Uh, on the fly assembly command to automatically calculate those offsets for me, like the, uh, the instructions to jump back to that address. So I'm going to do this. Okay. And that tells me what the bytes are to jump backwards to 1, 2, FT68. I'm going to come here and replace my CC shell code. With that, 9, AB, FB, FF, FF, which is just like jump a negative number backwards. And I see stuff there, so I'm going to start trying to execute dead beef as instructions. I did a paste insert instead of a paste uh, write. Address my uh, 
Either to my butt hole later on. I was using an old address. It's actually starting right here. So, dang, I gotta go back and uh, change. So to recalculate that jump, I'm just going to go ahead and set the exception handler back to a, um, a CC break for my shell code, my shell code back to CC. I didn't need to do that. So I'm just going to frazzle. CC. Here I need to jump, calculate my jump back to this address. Uh, one weird thing with assembly mode is you have to prefix the addresses with 0x and like other things with one debug. So that's what I need my little small shell code to be right here. So another important part of the payload you guys are developing, and the one that I showed, was that there was only one hard-coded address, which was the address of the pop-pop return instruction, which is um, very good in terms of reliability of exploits. The less hard-coded addresses you have, the better. And um, hard-coding the address of one pop-pop return isn't that bad, because with uh, something like Flash, if you know the, uh, the version of Flash that they're running, you could probably just query through the web browser interface, and it's easy to be like, all right, well, you're running that version, so I'll just have to use this pop up return address, and then bam, everything else is relative, and it's a super reliable exploit. That's right, Sam. The address we're returning to, we need to be at jump relative forward six bytes. So that pop-up return will make EIP point at these instructions, these opcodes. And then EB06 will make EIP point to these opcodes. And these opcodes right here represent a jump backwards for our shell code here because we don't have enough room on the stack to fit it in afterwards on this. And a lot of overflows when you're talking about a real application, the stack is big enough, you can definitely fit the shell code here. So now I have to do all this, but this is just kind of like a proof of concept program. The stack doesn't have a lot of room, so you got to do that jump backwards. Any questions? I'm uh, working on that second jump. Is it just uh, a jump to a specific address, or is there some yeah. way to relative jump backwards? It's a relative jump, and you calculate it with the A command. So once you do this first jump, EB06, EIT will be pointing like right here. 
So I'm going to make those CCs for now so it triggers a software break when it hits them. And then you can uh, figure out how to um, jump back to your shellcode by using the A command. So if you do A and then jump, let's assume my shellcode is at 12FB6C or something like that. I don't know, I'm just, you'll have to look that up. It'll uh, calculate it for you like so. 